when ChatGPT came out in, in late 2022, again, the people who had been working on it, they didn't know it was going to work. There had been previous, you know, we had worked on previous kinds of language models, things that try to uh, do things like predict what the next word will be in a sentence, those sorts of things. And they were really pretty crummy. And suddenly, uh, for reasons that we still don't understand, we kind of got above this threshold where it's like, yes, this is pretty human-like. Um, and uh, it's not clear what caused that threshold. That's so interesting. And I know that you work on something called computational thinking. And I think what you're saying now really relates to that. So help us understand the Wolfram project and computational thinking and how it's related to the fact that humans, we need to formalize and organize things, like you said, like mathematics and logic. Why do we, like, what's the history behind that? Why do we need to do that as humans? And then how does it relate to computational thinking in the future? In the 1600s, you know, math became sort of a popular way to think about the world. And then you could say, okay, we're looking at, well, roughly, you know, the a planet goes around the sun in roughly an ellipse, but let's let's put math into that, and then we can have this kind of way to actually compute what's going to happen. And then, so for about 300 years, kind of this, this idea of math is going to explain how the world works at some level was kind of a dominant theme, and that worked pretty well in physics. It worked pretty terribly in things like biology, in social sciences and so on, you know, people imagine there might be a social physics of how society works that never really panned out. Um, so, same, so, so there was sort of this question of uh, things that, the things were places where math had worked and it gave us a lot of modern engineering and so on, and there are cases where it hadn't really worked. I got pretty interested in this at the beginning of the 1980s and sort of figuring out how do you sort of formalize thinking about the world in a way that goes beyond what math provides one, things like mm. you know calculus and so on, give one. Uh, what I realized is that that you kind of you just think about well, there are definite rules that describe how things work, and those rules are more stated in terms of oh, you have this arrangement of black and white cells, and then this happens, and so on. They're not things that you necessarily can write in mathematical terms, in terms of multiplications and integrals and and things like this. And so I, as a matter of science, I kind of got interested in, so what do these simple programs that you can describe as the, these kind of systems as rules of being, what do they typically do? And kind of what one might have assumed is, you have a program that's simple enough, it's going to just do simple things. This turns out not to be true. Big surprise, to me at least. I think to everybody else as well. It took, took people a few decades to kind of absorb this point. It took me a, a solid bunch of years to absorb this point. But... You know, I, you just do these experiments, computer experiments, and you find out, yes, you use a simple rule, and no, it does a complicated thing. And that's, that turns out to be pretty interesting if you want to understand how nature works, because it seems like that's kind of, it's kind of the secret that nature uses to make a lot of the complicated stuff that we see, the same phenomenon of simple rules, complicated behavior. So that turns into a whole big direction and, and kind of new understanding about how science works. I wrote this big book back in 2002 called A New Kind of Science, which is, uh, well, its title kind of says what it is. Um, <laughs> the, it, it's, um, that that was, uh, uh, so that's one kind of branch is sort of understanding the world in terms mm -hmm. of sort of computational rules. Another thing has to do with taking the things that we normally think about whether that's, you know, how long is it going to take, how far is it from one city to another, or, you know, how, does, how do we, uh, you know, make this image have this, this uh, how do we remove, you know, this thing from this image or something like this, things that we would normally think about and talk about, and how do mm -hmm. we take those kinds of things and think about them in a structured computational way? And so that, that, that has turned into a big enterprise in my life, which is, building our computational language, this thing now called Wolfram language, that um, uh, powers a, a lot of kinds of, well, research and development kinds of things, and also lots of actual practical systems in the world. And so that's been mm. sort of a big effort to build up that computational language. Mm -hmm. one, one of the great things that happens when you make things computational is not only do you have a clearer way to describe what you're talking about, but also your computer 
can help you figure it out, so to speak. And that's going to be sort of the, uh, uh, an area of tremendous growth in the next however many years. It sounds really, really exciting. So my, I, I have a few follow-up questions to that. So you say that computational thinking is another layer in human evolution. So I want to understand why you feel it's going to help humans evolve. Also curious to understand like the practical ways that you're using the Wolfram language and how it relates to AI, at, if it does at all. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, so let's take the second thing first, okay? So, so yeah. um, Wolfram language is about representing the world computationally in a sort of precise computational way. It also happens to make use of a bunch of AI, but let's put that aside. The, okay. the, um, the, the way that, for example, something like an LLM, like a chat GPT or something like that, it, it's, what it does is it makes up pieces of language. So, you know, it's, it's, if we have a sentence like, you know, the cat sat on the blank, what it will have done is it's read a billion web pages. Chances are the, 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 the most common next word is going to be mat. And it has kind of set itself up so that it kind of knows that the most common next word is mat. So let's write down mat. So the big surprise is that it doesn't just do simple things like that, but having kind of built the structure from kind of reading all these web pages, it can write sort of plausible sentences. Those sentences might make, they, they sort of sound like they make sense. They're kind of typical of what you might read. They might or might not actually have anything to do with reality in the world, so to speak. So in a sense, Wolfram language, the, the big contribution right now to sort of the world of, of the emerging kind of AI language models, all this kind of thing, is that we have this computational view of the world, which allows one to do precise computations and build up these kind of whole towers of consequences. So the typical setup, and you'll see more, more and more coming out along these lines. Um, I mean, we built something with OpenAI back, back, oh gosh, a year ago now, uh, that was sort of a, an early version of this, is you've got the, the language model and it's trying to make up words, and then it gets to use as a tool our computational language. If it can formulate what it's talking about, well, you know, we have ways to take the natural language that it produces. We've had our Wolfram Alpha system, which came out in 2009, is a system that has natural language understanding. We sort of had solved the problem of small sentence, you know, one sentence at a time, kind of, uh, what does this mean? Can we translate this natural language in English, for example, into computational language, then compute an answer using potentially many, many steps of computation, um, and then, then that's something that is sort of a solid answer that was computed from knowledge that we've curated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of the, the, the typical mode of interaction is there's sort of a linguistic interface provided by things like LLMs, and that, that using our computational language as a tool to actually figure out, hey, this is the thing that's actually true, so to speak. So that's kind of the, the core part of um, the... Uh, how the technology I've been building for a long time kind of most immediately fits into the, the current uh, sort of expansion of excitement about, about AI and, and language models and, and so on. Yeah. Well, this is so fascinating. Honestly, you're teaching us so much. I feel like a lot of people tuning in are probably learning a lot of this stuff for the first time. But one thing that we all are using right now is ChatGBT, right? So everybody has sort of embraced ChatGBT. It kind of feels like it's magic, right? When you're just getting something that is uh, giving you something that a human could potentially write. Uh, so I have a couple questions about ChatGPT. You alluded to how it works a bit, but can you give us more detail about how neural networks work in general and what ChatGPT is doing in the background to spit out something that looks like it's written by a human? The original inspiration for neural networks was understanding something about how brains work. You know, in our brains, we have about roughly 100 billion neurons. Each neuron is a little electrical device, so to speak, and they're kind of connected with things that kind of look under a microscope a bit like wires. So one neuron might be connected to a thousand or ten thousand other neurons in one's brain, and these neurons kind of they'll have a little electrical signal, and then they'll pass on that electrical signal to another neuron, and uh, pretty soon, you know, there's one's gone through a whole chain of neurons, and one says the word next word or whatever. 
Um, the, uh, and so this kind of the electrical machine, kind of lots of things connected to things, that was, that's kind of how people imagine that brains work. And, and that's how neural nets are kind of an idealization of that uh, set up in a computer where what one has these, um, uh, th these connections between sort of artificial neurons, usually called weights. You often hear about people saying, you know, uh, this, this thing has a trillion weights or something. Mm. Those, are, those are kind of the, the connections between artificial neurons, and each one has a number associated with it. And so what happens when, you know, when you ask ChatGPT something, what will happen is it will take the words that it's seen so far, the prompt, and it will grind them up into numbers, and it will take that sequence of numbers and feed that in as input to this network. So it's just, it's just saying here, are, it, it takes the words, every, more or less every word in English gets a number, or every part of a word gets a number. You have the sequence of numbers. That sequence of numbers is, is given as input to this essentially mathematical computation that goes through and says, OK, here's, here's this arrangement of numbers. We multiply each number by this weight. Then we add up a bunch of numbers. Then we take sort of a threshold of those numbers and so on. And we keep doing this, and we do it a sequence of times, like a few hundred times for, for typical kind of chat GPT type, type, type behavior, a few hundred times. And then at the end, we get out another number. Actually, we get out another collection of numbers that represent the probabilities that the next word should be this or that. So in the mm. example of the cat sat on the, the next word has probably very high probability, 99% probability to be mat, and 1% uh, you know, probability or 0.5% probability to be floor or something. And mm -hmm. then what, what ChatGPT is doing is it's saying, well, usually I'm going to pick the most likely next word. Sometimes I'll pick a word that isn't the, the absolutely most likely next word, and it just keeps doing that. So, and the surprise is that just doing that kind of thing, a word at a time, gives you something that seems like a reasonable English sentence. Now, the, the next question is, well, how did it figure out all those weights that, how did it get all those, all those in the case of the original ChatGPT, I think it was uh, 180 billion uh, weights. Um, how, did it, how did it get those numbers? And the answer is, what, what it tried to do was it, it was trained, and it was trained by being shown all this text from the web. And what was happening was, it was like, well, you've got one arrangement of weights. OK, what, what next word does that predict? OK, that predicts turtle as the next word for the cat sat on the. Turtle is wrong. Let's change that. Let's see what happens if we you know, adjust these weights in that way. Oh, we finally got it to say mat. Great, that's the correct version of that particular weight. Well, you keep doing that over and over again. That takes huge amounts of computer effort. You keep on bashing it and trying to get it, no, 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 you got it wrong. You know, adjust it slightly to make it closer to correct. Keep doing that long enough, and you get something which is a neural net, which has the property that it will typically reproduce the th kinds of things it's seen. Now, mm. it's not enough to reproduce what it's seen. Because if you keep going, writing a big, long essay, a lot of what's in that essay will never have been seen before. It will, it will be something that those particular combination of words will never have been produced before. So then the question is, well, how does it extrapolate? How does it figure out something that it's never seen before? What words is it going to use when it never saw it before? And this is the thing which nobody knew what was going to happen. It's, this is the thing where the big surprise is that the way it extrapolates is similar to the way we humans seem to extrapolate things. And mm -hmm. presumably, that's because its structure is similar to the structure of our brains. We don't really know why it sort of, when it, when it figures things out that it, that it hasn't seen before, why it does that in a kind of human-like way. That's kind of a, a scientific discovery. Now, we can say, you know, can we get an idea why this might happen? I think we have an idea why it might happen. And it's more or less this that you say, how do you put together an English sentence? Well, you kind of learn basic grammar. You say, it's a noun, a verb, a noun. That's a sort of typical English sentence. But there are many noun, verb, noun English sentences that aren't really reasonable sentences, like, I don't know, uh, uh, the electron ate the moon. OK, it's grammatically correct, but it probably 
doesn't really mean anything, except mm -hmm. in some kind of poetic sense. So the question then is, then what you realize is there's a more elaborate construction kit about sentences that might mean something. And people have been, have been intending to kind of create that construction kit for a couple of thousand years. I mean, Aristotle started, the time when he created logic, he started thinking about that kind of construction kit, but nobody got around to doing it. And, um, but I think, you know, ChatGPT and, and LLMs kind of show us there is a construction kit of, oh, you know, that word, the, if, if it's blah, eight, blah, the first blah better be a thing that eats things. And there's a certain category of things that eat things. And, you know, that's like animals and people and so on. And, uh, uh, and so that's sort of part of the construction kit. So you end up with this kind of notion of a kind of semantic grammar of a, a, a way, a construction kit of how you put words together. My guess is that's essentially what ChatGPT has discovered. And uh, once we understand that more clearly, we'll probably be able to build things like ChatGPT much more simply than its very indirect way to do it, to have this neural net and keep bashing it and say, you know, make it, you know, predict words better and so on. There's probably a more direct way to do the same kind of thing. And that's, you know, happens to be the direction that I've spent a good part of my life trying to, trying to build up. And these things are very kind of complementary in the sense that this, the kind of things like the linguistic interface that are made possible by neural nets kind of feed into this kind of precise computation that, uh, that, we, that we can do on that side. Yeah, this is so interesting. And, and my next question for you is, how does this make you feel about human consciousness and AI potentially being sentient or having any sort of agency? One of the things that kind of was a big piece of bunch of science I've done is this thing called the principle of computational equivalence, which is kind of this, this discovery, this idea that if you look at different kinds of systems operating according to different rules, whether it's a brain or the weather, there is a certain, there's a, a commonality. There's the same level of computation is achieved by those different kinds of systems. And that's, that's not obvious. It's, it's kind of like, you might say, well, I've got the system and it's just a system that's made from physics as opposed to the system that's the result of lots of biological evolution or whatever, or I've got the system and it just operates according to these very simple rules that I can write down. It's, it's kind of um, uh, the, the um, we've got, um, uh, you might have thought that the sort of level of computation that will be achieved in those different cases would be very different. The big surprise is that it isn't, it's the same. And that has all kinds of consequences. Like if you say, okay, I've got this system in nature, let me predict what's gonna happen in it. Well, essentially what you're doing by, by saying, I'm gonna predict what's gonna happen is, you're somehow setting yourself up as being smarter than the system in nature. It will take mm. it all these computational steps to figure out what it does, but you are going to just jump ahead and say, this is what's gonna happen in the end. Well, the fact that there's this principle of computational equivalence implies this thing I call computational irreducibility, which is this, the, the realization that there are many systems where to work out what will happen in that system, you have to do kind of an irreducible amount of computational work. And that's a, that's a surprise because we kind of have been used to the idea that kind of science lets us kind of jump ahead and just say, oh, this is the, what the answer is gonna be. And this is kind of showing us from within science, it's showing us that there's a fundamental limitation where we can't do that. And that's, that's mm. important you know, when it comes to thinking about things like AI, when you say things like, well, let's make sure that AIs never do the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem with that is there's this phenomenon of computational irreducibility. The AI is doing what the AI does. It's doing all these computations and so on. We can't know in advance. We can't just jump ahead and say, oh, we know what it's going to do. We are, we are stuck kind of having to follow through these steps. We can try and make an AI where we can always know what it's going to do. Turns out that AI will be too dumb to be a serious AI. And in fact, we already mm. we see that happening in recent times of people saying, let's make sure they don't do the wrong thing. Well, you put enough constraints, it can't really do the things that a computational system should be able to do. And it, uh, it, it doesn't really achieve the kind of this, this level of, of, of capability that you might call sort of real AI, so to speak.